Friends, welcome to Colonial Park, United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, where being the operative word these days, where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Thank you for choosing to worship with us wherever you are, for taking the time out of your day to say your time with God and with community is important. Thank you for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for giving of your time. We invite you and remind you to sign in. We have the pew pad link, if you will, that is uh, there for you to sign. Or you can comment or you can send us an email. In some way, just let us know that you've, uh, that you've watched our services and we're always welcome to hear your feedback or whether or not you appreciate it and what you found meaningful. Just a couple of announcements. Um, really, all of them are in your bulletin. Hopefully you have that in front of you so that you're able to follow along in the service. One thing I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to do uh, was once again thank our young people and their families for leading us in worship last week. We had received so many positive comments and uh, pieces of gratitude for the work that they did, and so thank you for giving of your time and your talents to the church. Additionally, last week we began our new sermon series called Unraveled, and we have um, study guides or study journals for you to follow along with each week's topic. And Saturday's email from me uh, will also include a prayer practice that that goes along with that week's theme. So I just want to make sure that you are paying special attention and on the lookout for those pieces and the ways that you can access uh, to get a little bit more out of this series that we're doing in this time of unraveling in our own lives in this series called Unraveled. I had to laugh. I found myself thinking that Pastor Scott's sermon today could be entitled, Whatever You Do, Don't Look Down. And I think that's a little bit where we are at in this uh, time, in this pandemic. We thank you for your prayers. We have council meeting on Monday night, and um, we will know a little bit more. The leaders of the church will be sharing a, a bit more about how we move forward in this time. And may we continue to look up rather than looking down in this time. That all being said, my friends, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Friends, won't you join with me in our call to worship today? And again, a simple reminder for you to share in the bold parts that are in the bulletin as a response so that you can hear yourself responding in these ways as well. God, you are a God of invitation. You invited Abraham to follow you. You invited the disciples to drop their nets. You invited the children to draw near. You invited Peter to walk on water. You invited the tax collector to dinner. You invited the Samaritan woman into eternal life. Just the same, you invite us to live lives of faith. Give us the strength to say yes. Let us worship our good and holy God. Let us pray. Through the storms of life, O oh God, you are with your people in the person of Jesus, your Son. Calm our fears and strengthen our faith that we may never doubt his presence among us, but proclaim that he is your Son, risen from the dead, living forever and ever. Amen.
As we come to our time of confession, we remember that we are not God, that we sit in God's presence, that when the winds of change blow and tumultuous waves roll, our instincts often cause us to turn away from God. We run away from our fear toward our own foolish anecdotes or desires. Let us in this time turn back. Turn back toward God and face our fears together with Jesus. Let us join in our prayer of confession. God of the wind and the sea, you invite us to be brave but we are more familiar with fear. You invite us to trust you, but we'd rather trust wind and gravity. You invite us to believe in ourselves, but we have never been good at that. You invite us to move, to change, and to take a risk, but we stay planted where we are, afraid of the ways that grow, growth might hurt. Forgive us for our self-doubt and fear. We believe despite our unbelief. Amen. My friends, the good news is this. God is not only the source of forgiveness, but is the source of courage. So take heart. In God, you will find everything you need. Even in the midst of the storms of life, God is there to save you. Amen. Friends, let us come to God in prayer as we offer our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, we listen for you in wind, earthquake, and fire. Unexpectedly, you speak in the sound of silence. We pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will silence in us all the storms, doubts, and fears that overwhelm, so that we may hear what you have to say so that we may hear your still, small voice, thin, quiet, yet compelling, commanding all the same. We ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Our gospel lesson today comes from the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Today's reading is from the message translation. Listen for the still speaking words of Christ. As soon as the meal was finished, he insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the people. With the crowd dispersed, he climbed, in, uh, he climbed the mountain so he could be by himself to pray. This is Jesus. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea when a wind came against them and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, because don't all things mysterious come about at four o'clock in the morning, At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly bold, said, Master, if it's you, 
Call me to come to you. Call me to come to you on the water. And he said, come ahead. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and started to sink. He cried, Master, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand and he said, oh, faint heart, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, worshiped Jesus, saying, this is it. You are God's son for sure. My friends, the good news is God is still speaking. Amen. Friends, let us pray together. God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you this day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oh, Peter, God bless you. This scene is so characteristically Peter. He is the disciple who is so often the first one to speak whether the time is right or not, the first to jump into a conversation and spout his suggestions and anecdotes. And he's quick to wig out and lose self-control as soon as things start to get uncomfortable and difficult. Yes, this is so like me. I mean Peter. No, I really mean me. Of all the scriptures we are studying in this series, Unraveled, this is the one that speaks to me right away. Peter is the character that I can probably identify most with in the Bible. I am so Peter in this story in like a hundred different ways. But let's be honest, the man gets a bad rap for this story as it's told. Several translations interpret the words of Jesus after Peter stumbles as you of little faith. And those words certainly sting. And maybe they were true of Peter in that moment, but they almost seem like an unjust censure of the very real fear of this situation. The more I read the story and try to relate to it, the less it feels like it's about any lack of faith in Peter. After all, if Peter didn't have faith in Jesus' power, he wouldn't have asked Jesus to call him out on the water at all. What I instead find in the story is a deep sense of connection to what it is like to be human in a time of crisis. We all know what that's like right now. But Peter's crisis didn't begin with this storm in the middle of the night. Let's rewind for a moment and look at what else has been happening in the lives of the disciples leading up to this point. They've left their families behind at least for the time being, to follow this strange and radical teacher. They've witnessed him perform signs and miracles that have changed their entire perception of reality. They've heard him interpret the ancient scriptures of their religion in ways that challenge their theology. They've seen him interact with people in places and in conversations that have challenged all of their assumptions. Jesus has pretty much turned everything upside down in their lives. Oh, and if that wasn't already enough, at the beginning of this same chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, John the Baptist, who the disciples had grown to revere and love and respect, is beheaded for being a troublemaker and is served to Herod's wife on a silver platter, literally. So if I try and put myself in Peter's situation, it feels pretty overwhelming. And from what I know about myself, there's not much chance I could successfully rely on my own judgment in such a situation. And so we come to this word, unraveled. 
I can only imagine that Peter and the other disciples were feeling pretty unraveled in this situation. They're tired, they're confused, they're bewildered, they're frightened. Heck, they're freaking out. And here comes Jesus floating across the water saying, take courage, don't be afraid. And I'm sure, being disciples and all, it was really easy for them in that moment to just stop being afraid as the waves continued to batter the boat and it filled with water because Jesus hasn't calmed the storm yet in this story. And good, faithful Peter is going to take control of the situation and put matters into his own hands. And I like how Eugene Peterson's interpretation in the message says that Peter was suddenly bold. I have an idea, he might say to himself, and he asks Jesus for quite possibly the most impossible thing in the situation. And shockingly, Jesus goes along with it. Come ahead, Jesus said calmly, and Peter steps out in faith, we might add. And all goes well at first, until Peter looks at the waves churning below him. And then he panics. And he loses his nerve, as the translation says, and, oh God, he begins to sink. And there is screaming and crying and desperate pleas for help. And Jesus reaches out his hand. And he grabs Peter out of the water. And he says, faint heart. Not you of little faith, but in this translation, faint heart. What got into you? What changed? Why were you suddenly afraid when just moments ago you had all the faith necessary to walk on water? What happened to Peter? I don't know. Being human happened to Peter. I can't tell you how many situations similar to the plot line of this story I found myself in with God. I feel powerless and afraid, and I know in my gut that I am sunk if I don't rely on Jesus. And I want to trust, but I'm going to need a sign. And not just any sign, because God has already given me signs. Like Peter, I've already seen God perform miracles in my life. I've already felt the comforting presence of Jesus. I've already been saved more than once. And pff, dang it, you'd think that'd be enough. But it's not. And apparently it wasn't for Peter either. No, God, I say, I want us to really test my faith this time. So I'm going to ask you for something really hard, like impossibly hard, and really... You need to make sure that it has all of my desired outcomes and feels completely exhausting and uses every last bit of my intellect because that's the only thing that's going to make sense to me. Because my fear makes me completely insane. And I become just like Naaman. I hear the words of Jesus echo the words of the prophet in that story. If I had asked you to do something difficult, you would have done it. So why do you hold back? And meanwhile, my life unravels, and I am sinking, and I am crying out to Jesus because my way of doing things isn't working. Again, shocking. And Jesus grabs my hand and pulls my sogginess up out of the water and asks with all the calmness, of a wise old sage. What got into you? I recently watched Sight and Sound's theater production of Jesus. This story on the sea appears in the movie, and in it Jesus has some additional dialogue that's not found in the Bible text. But we can easily read it between the lines. Jesus shouts out to Peter when he's sinking into the water, Peter! Keep your eyes on me, not on the storm. You can do it. Keep your eyes on me, not on the storm around you. And at first, Peter does just what Jesus asks. 
And he walks across the waves, and amazed at his own success, he then looks away from Jesus and quickly begins to sink as fear overwhelms him once again as he becomes aware of the waves. What was the moment when things went wrong? You know. I know. We all know. It's the age-old test of faith. It's the answer we've heard a thousand times, and we hear it again today. It's why we keep coming back here to hear it. Because we need to hear it again and again. Keep your eyes on Jesus. When things get rough, turn your eyes upon Jesus. My friends, life has been slowly unraveling all around us over these last eight weeks. We don't know what to think. We don't know what to expect. Everything that we know and have taken for granted has now been turned upside down. And we don't know when things will feel safe, when they'll feel normal again. And we're tired. And we're grieving. Let me say that again. We're grieving. We are grieving our friends and family members who are sick or who have died. We're grieving the fact that we can't properly grieve them right now in social isolation. We're grieving social isolation, the lack of physical connection and presence. We are grieving the need to do life completely differently right now, to not get to do what we want, to not get to see the people that we want, to not get to go where we want to go. We are grieving. The whole world is grieving this loss. So what do we do? What do we do in this time of grief that threatens to unravel us? The answer is we grieve. We let ourselves grieve because we are human and grief and crisis and struggle are a part of life, whether we like it or not. And as much as I hate to admit this reality, God never promised us a life without sorrow or pain. God didn't even spare Jesus pain and suffering, which has to mean that there is some hidden purpose in pain, but whether or not that's true, it sure doesn't feel very comforting right now because there's nothing comfortable about pain or grief there's nothing comfortable about the feeling of sinking into the waves. There's nothing comfortable about a pandemic. So where is Jesus going to show up in all this? Well, he already has. The better question is where are we going to look in this time of crisis? Are we going to keep our eyes on the storm that's going on around us? Or are we going to fix our eyes ahead on Jesus? What will you do in that moment of panic when the waves of grief and pain and loss swamp your boat, when the fear feels like it's drowning you and you can't breathe and you just want to escape in any way possible, any way that doesn't require walking through to the other side? What will you do? And where will you look for help? If you've ever seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Lost Crusade, you may remember the scene where he arrives at the edge of this chasm, almost falling off as his run comes to a screeching halt. And there is no bridge. And death is looming behind him, and there is no choice but to take a step right off the edge of the cliff, right into what feels like certain bitter death. And with clenched fists and bated breath, the man steps off the edge, only to discover right at that panicked moment an invisible bridge that forms a path across the abyss to safety. And that bridge is grace. 
You see, if he had never taken that first step forward, he never would have crossed to safety. If he had chosen not to face death and fear head on and follow the voice within himself, he would have been overcome. That would have been the end of that. And instead, the very step that looked and felt like it was off the edge of a cliff was the very step that saved him. You may be standing at the edge of that abyss. We all have our own abyss. And there's only one way to get across. So in your moment of fear, where are you going to look? Are you going to look down into the abyss? Are you going to look around you at the storm? Or are you going to look straight ahead at Jesus and take a deep breath and just take a step forward on faith, trusting that that step is right where you need to be? Don't think twice. Don't believe what fear has to tell you because Jesus has already shown up and he is already waiting to catch you if you fall. You will be okay. We will be okay. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah.
Friends, let us join together in our affirmation of faith, which this week refers, um, as was last week as well, we used the same affirmation of faith in this series that refers to God as a sower, S-E-W-E-R. Often in church, right, we think of it sowing seeds. But this one is an image of God as a sower, um, as the weaver, the one who mends um, the tapestry. So let us come together in our affirmation. I believe in God, the great sower, who weaves us together in community, collecting our loose ends and turning them into belonging. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who hems us in before and behind, catching us when we fall and writing us into God's holy narrative. And I believe in Jesus Christ, who loved and claimed the people society had thrown out, refusing to discard anyone as scrap. I believe God has woven part of God's self into the fiber of our being, making us inherently worthy of love and belonging. I believe the fabric of my life is weak that I am prone to error and need God's handiwork to remind me of love. I believe in the church and that like a quilt of different fabrics, she is designed to be as diverse and beautiful as God's creation. And I believe that when life unravels, God is there to stitch my wounds together, to hold me in the palm of God's hand, to tell me of love, and to invite me into a new journey. Amen. So we come to our time of prayer and prayers of the people, a simple reminder that We are continually in prayer for you. We have our prayer chain that continues to pray for our growing lists, as well as receiving and celebrating with you of updates of healing and new life that have happened. So please feel free to share your prayer requests with us through our online form, through an email sent, through a text or a phone call. Let us pray. O God, you have called us to be a people of prayer, to continue the ministry of intercession handed on to us by Jesus Christ himself. And so we come before you with confidence, bringing our prayers for the world you love. In your mercy, Hear our prayer and hear and answer. We pray for those who, like Jesus' disciples, find themselves surrounded by high winds and stormy seas, those who feel overwhelmed by events and circumstances, the loss of a job, the death of a loved one, a serious accident or illness, chronic pain, depression, or divorce, and who don't know where to turn, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those like Joseph who find themselves deeply wounded by people they love, people they thought they knew and trusted, and who are struggling to know how to respond, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for those like Peter who are experiencing a crisis of faith, who long to wholeheartedly trust in God, but are held back by questions and doubts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who, like the prophet Elijah, have fallen into despair who have begun to doubt God's presence and power or question God's call in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for those who, like Joseph, have had their hopes and dreams crushed, those whose lives have suddenly taken a different turn and who now wonder what lies ahead for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, it is not your will that any should suffer. So we offer our prayers for all who hunger and thirst, those who live in the midst of violence or poverty, those who feel abandoned or ignored by the world around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Through the life-giving power of your Holy Spirit, make your sustaining presence known to all who are in pain or need so that they too may know your love and live. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives to intercede for us, we pray all of this. Amen. Friends, we come together for our mission moment, and this week it is for Help Ministries. Christian Churches United has a goal to raise $50,000 to provide additional support to households in need during this pandemic and economic turndown. So far, they've received $31,000. Many of you have asked how you can help people on the margins in this current crisis. Perhaps you are receiving a stimulus check and are in a position to help some of your neighbors. Due to the shelters being quarantined, it's very difficult to find housing for families and individuals. With the money raised, they will be able to provide housing costs, medication assistance, and staff support. The fund is aimed at helping individuals and families who have li limited financial options, who may not fit the requirements of other publicly funded programs. For those interested in helping, you can make your check payable to CPUCC with CCU COVID-19 in the memo and send it to the church. Thank you for your generosity. God sees all things. God sees our comings and our goings, our strengths and our weaknesses, our needs and our desires. God sees. God sees in us the potential we do not yet see in ourselves. Just like when Jesus said to Peter, come ahead then. I invite you to share your offerings and your gifts out of the abundance that is God's vision. Perhaps even as courageously and as boldly as Peter stepping out of that boat. Please remember that while the church building is closed, our resource, resources are still needed and still used, bills need to be paid, and your faithful contributions to this ministry make a difference. There are ways in your bulletin for you to continue to offer your financial support, but I just want to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for your continued support during this time. We have been truly overwhelmed by your response and your continued love for Christ Church and for your staff and for all who are um, cared for through our ministry. So thank you so much. Please give with cheerful hearts as you are able.
Friends, let us join together in our prayer of dedication then. Gracious God, you call us to let go of the things we cling to and to step out in faith, trusting in your love and provision. Give us courage to step out boldly and sufficient faith to follow without fear. Take our lives and our gifts, use them to accomplish more than we could possibly imagine so that through us, your kingdom might come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. My friends, receive this blessing and benediction then as you go from this place, wherever this place is, this place in your heart, this place, this time, this space. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you and go, here's my hand.
Take it. Be lifted up. Don't look down. Whatever you do, keep your eyes on me. Go in peace. Love and serve God gladly. Amen.